And I want to start with a quote, and the quote is from Frederick Douglass. The scene was wild and grand. Joy and gladness exhausted all forms of expression, from shouts of praise to joy and tears. And that was how Douglass described the moment when word first arrived over the telegraph um, that Abraham Lincoln had signed the Emancipation Proclamation on New Year's Day, 1863. We shout for joy that we live to record this righteous decree, as Douglas said. But the word joy probably could not be used to describe the ceremony, if you could call it a ceremony, at which Lincoln affixed his name to the document. In fact, he had spent much of the day at a public New Year's levy in the White House, um, pumping hands with hundreds and hundreds of guests, some of whom he knew, some of whom were just members of the public who gained admittance in the tradition of the day. Lincoln might have signed the proclamation earlier on New Year's Day, but in fact, proofread it and found a uh, problem with the template at the bottom, which says, um, I hereunto set my seal, or hereunto sign my name and affix the seal of the United States. It was probably garbled just as I have garbled it here, but he said it's not right. And um, you know, you might as well take it back and do it right. Uh, it's New Year's Day, but get that professional scribe away from his grog and have him get to work on this. And um, so Lincoln just went to the reception and greeted people. And it's 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and the so-called midnight hour that I'll show you a, a picture of as we move on in, this, um, in my portfolio of pictures, came and went by 13 hours. Um, Douglas may have shouted for joy, but they must have actually been <laughs> totally fearful that Lincoln was going to back down. In fact, there were plenty of rumors in the newspapers that Lincoln was, was not going to do it. He had told only a few people that he felt he was under orders from God, in fact, to fulfill the promise that he'd made 100 days before and signed the proclamation. And yet, he didn't help himself in immortalizing the moment visually because he signed it in the late afternoon, a winter late afternoon. I don't even know if there was any light in the room by the time he got back up there to look at the redraft. But um, there was no photographer in the place, needless to say, no official ceremony, no artist that would come later. The only people in the room were his private secretary, the Secretary of State, and the Secretary of State's private secretary, a lot of secretaries in there, who also happened to be where Seward was concerned, his son, Frederick. Those were the only witnesses and as the, you probably have heard this story before, I'll dramatize it anyway to the best of my ability, but they unfurl this scroll again. It's got the seal, it's got the ribbons, and Lincoln probably proofread it one more time. It had been messed up the first time, so he reads it. And then he picks up the pen to sign, and then he put the pen down. And then he picked up the pen, and then he put the pen down. Now, the three witnesses must have thought as... Frederick Douglass and people in churches around the North, well, I guess he doesn't have the backbone, as one person, diarist George Templeton Strong wrote, does he have the backbone? And then Lincoln looked up and said, I've been shaking hands for hours, and it's not calculated to help a man's chirography or chirography, whatever the period pronunciation is for a word that's gone out of use, it means penmanship. So he simply sat and massaged his hands. He said, if my hand falters, if my signature looks tremulous, people will look at it 100 years from now and say he hesitated. And my whole heart is in this. It's the most important act of the 19th century. And I want the signature to reflect my earnestness. Only after another five or 10 minutes of this massage he was doing did he pick up the pen and sign Abraham Lincoln. And he looked at it very proudly, looked up and said, That'll do. And that was why the delay and why the non-ceremonial aspect of, of, the, of the event. And what I'm showing you here, I show um, because it is one of the few um, period 
or even close to period, evocations of emancipation. Uh, what it is is a, um, an edition that was printed in Philadelphia by these Union League Club founders named Leland and Boker, who decided to print them and sell them for $10 each at the Sanitary Fair in Philadelphia in 1864. They printed them off and sent them up to Lincoln, and he and William Seward and John Nicolay, three of the four witnesses at that, uh, two of the three witnesses at the event, signed them and sent them back to Philadelphia. They didn't sell out for $10 each in 1864. Leland and Boker sent them on to Boston, and, uh, and um, some of them sold and some of them never did. One just sold for $2.1 million, and this copy is in the White House. Uh, President Obama keeps it in his um, in the in the Oval Office. And um, a few years ago, there was a an extraordinary reunion of what were called civil rights veterans, uh, men and women, elderly who had been on the front lines in the '60s at yeah. lunch counters and buses and demonstrations. And he brought them all in to proudly show them this document, um, which in its day had such a rough iconography. Why? Well, what was the problem? Well, if anybody has read this document, um, and I calculate that few people even did at the time, you know that it's written in deadly legalistic prose, um, not any measure of the kind of soaring prose that Lincoln was fully capable of. And even at the time, that was noticed. Frederick Douglass said there is no uh, proclaim liberty throughout the world in this. There are no hosannas. And scholars ever since have made the same point, including Richard Hofstadter, who famously said it has all the moral grandeur of a bill of lading, uh, a cargo <laughs> list. And that's not a bad metaphor in a way, and, and in a way not an, an insulting one, because it is a, a cataloging of a promise that he had made the previous September, a list of exemptions that he felt were required by law. But it's not inspiring. And for a while, it did not inspire much in the way of commemoration. It was, and I think we have to remember this, in looking at the iconography of the proclamation, it was controversial. We may look back at it and say, it could have happened sooner, it could have been broader, he could have fought for a constitutional amendment earlier. But if you read the newspaper responses, um, as I've been doing for another project, and he, just include the newspaper responses in New York City, reaction was divided along party lines, and the Democrats assailed the proclamation as, as one put it, an incitement to um, racial violence. Um, Lincoln's call for African Americans to bear arms and fight in behalf of their own freedom was extremely controversial. When he had issued the preliminary proclamation 100 days earlier in September 1862, Lincoln himself sadly admitted that the stock market <coughs> fell. Troops deserted um, in greater numbers than they had before. And then came uh, congressional elections, which were almost as uh, bad news for President Lincoln as the 2010 congressional elections were for President Obama. I mean, had the South had his representatives still in the House and Senate, they would have been overwhelmed and lost their majority. In, Democrats made huge gains, not only in Congress, but in state houses and in state legislatures. And the fact that Lincoln, in fact, issued the proclamation into the teeth of a fall campaign is something that's not usually acknowledged. A hundred days notice followed by a, one of the strangest messages in, in the history of Lincoln literature, and that is the December 1st, 1862 annual message to Congress, the equivalent of today's State of the Union messages in which Lincoln is best remembered, uh, it is best remembered for this wonderful peroration where Lincoln says, we cannot escape history, we'll be remembered in spite of ourselves. Uh, it's beautifully written, a uh, call to bravery and, and um, moving forward with emancipation it's in Aaron Copeland's Lincoln portrait, but he's not only talking about emancip emancipation. He's also talking about um, gradual and compensated emancipation in the loyal slave states, 
the so-called border states, and voluntary colonization. And when he says we cannot escape history, he's talking about a complete package which seems retrograde to us today. A few hours later, the Union suffers a massive defeat at the Battle of Fredericksburg, and then we set the stage for the New Year's Day that I opened with. So it's no wonder, in a sense, uninspiring prose, delays, procrastination, political <coughs> risk, controversy, racism, Lincoln's own adding of the colonization piece to the mix. By the way, in Lincoln's suggestion for compensated emancipation, he uses the date 1900. Technically, I know it's not the 20th century, but let's say it's the 20th century. It's the only time he ever mentioned a specific date in the 20th century in the entire Lincoln canon. And what was that date? That was the date by which he thought slavery would really disappear in America. So in a way, the visual response is measured at first. And in an early example, reflecting again the fact that Lincoln did not provide the photographic models that were essential for print publishers to produce their derivative works, one took this, the Cooper Union photograph, which I've written about before, and I could spend 20 minutes talking about, but I would spare you, and use that as the centerpiece for this sort of tree of life version of the Emancipation Proclamation. The words were occasionally used, and you know they weren't inspiring, so they were devices that were imposed that were intended, I suppose, to make it more attractive, such as this distracted sentry. I don't know what he's looking at, but there's one example. Here's another. Um, as um, artists became more inventive, the, the, the devices that they usually turned to were comparative uh, illustrations. The scenes on the left reminding people of the degradation um, of slavery, auctions, and uh, dogs chasing runaways, and on the right, the promise of um, education and prosperity and religion, uh, and all because of the proclamation. Also interesting that it's still an old photograph. Lincoln has not yet provided another model. Here's a piece in the same manner. These are among the few <coughs> that were published in 1864. Everything I've shown you is 64. A year and change goes by before these artists really begin depicting the Emancipation Proclamation, even in this unimaginative format. And I think the reason they, well, the reason they delayed, I've explained or proposed, the reason they finally started coming through, I think, was because 1864 is a presidential election year. And now, Lincoln images become part of the campaign and there is more of a demand. I know that you've probably heard this um, before during this uh, conference, but this is a like a crucible of the Holzer Neely Borat uh, Troika, uh, uh, of not only of books but of uh, elemental philosophy. And that is, these things were not political statements; they were commercial. You know, they were like candy bars. They are producing printmakers are producing things for to sell them and make money. Very rarely. Uh, are they doing it out of um, political conviction? Courier and Ives, as I think I have an example later, are just as adept and willing to do anti-Lincoln material as they are willing and adept to do pro-Lincoln material in 1860 and 1864. They're not treasonous, but they're not doing this because they love the proclamation. It's because they think there's a customer base for things like this. Also, 1864. Now, this is an interesting one. Um, because it is, um, it is, what is it? It's the 1860, <clears throat> yeah, this is the final proclamation. And in Lincoln's hand, uh, it had been purchased by a, uh, it had been donated by Lincoln to a charity fair in um, Chicago, purchased by an entrepreneur, an art entrepreneur named Thomas Bryan, who had a gallery of famous Americans for which Lincoln had refused to pose after he was elected president. Never one to say die. Bryan bought this. It was photographed, and he reproduced it as a lithograph. But th those words are those words, and that's what we have. Here's another example. Emancipation calligraphy. 
became a rather interesting subculture. Um, and of course, that was achieved by darkening the words of the proclamation. Here's a colorful one with Lady Liberty and Justice weighing in, breaking into the scene, actually. Here's one that uh, came out in 64 by Franklin Smith of Philadelphia. Um, and uh, Lincoln doesn't even get top billing here. He's down uh, at the bottom with, his, with the Seward and Horace Greeley, believe it or not, and George Washington, the slaveholder, gets, gets the <laughs> position under the eagle. Um, it's a, why do I show it? Because Franklin Smith actually brought this picture to the White House for Lincoln to see and was smart enough, thank goodness. I wish we'd had this for the Lincoln image. We had it for a little pamphlet that we did, at, well, a booklet called Changing the Lincoln Image. Um, um, he did this, uh, Franklin Smith came to Washington and showed it to Abraham Lincoln. And Lincoln looked at this kind of piece and the calligraphy and he said, that is what I call ingenious nonsense. That's what he called all of these pieces. Now that's without seeing this, which is um, to show you um, how difficult, uh, what a challenge it was, and uh, um, an unrewarding challenge, and certainly not fulfilling the expectations of potential buyers. This um, Lincoln bestriding his home, his log cabin home, like some sort of a gargantuan figure, um, Columbia's son, as an emancipator. Um, here again, old images are used. This is a photograph that was made in 1861, right after Lincoln arrived in Washington. He took it to deflect the reigning image of him as a coward. He had just arrived in Washington, uh, widely reported in, reportedly in disguise. So here he is posing in his new $100 suit at Alexander Gardner's gallery. And the result was a picture of Lincoln signing the proclamation, also 1864. Now, there is an exception to the, to the delay, and that is, and it wasn't a commercial success. Maybe you can figure out why. <laughs> this is a, a painting by David Gilmour Blythe. He's a German-born, sort of an expressionist painter, and he has an interesting idea, which is a sort of a symbolic rendering of what inspired Abraham Lincoln to write the proclamation. Um, you see all the devices here, and with Lincoln's one slipper off, we're reminded that he's just a homespun kind of guy, uh, but he's got the Bible there, he's got a rail splitter's mall to remind himself of his own early labors, um, an American flag uh, as a curtain, and you see over his left shoulder there is a bust of President James Buchanan hanging from its neck <laughs> on the bookcase. Well. A Cincinnati printmaker gamely put it out as a lithograph in 1863. Now this would have been one of the first prints of the Emancipation Proclamation, and he certainly cleaned it up. I mean, he cleaned up the portraiture, basing it on, a, on an 1863 photograph. But there are so few of these. I mean, here you can even see the devices more clearly, the scales of justice, et cetera. Um, so few of these exist. I find it reasonable to, to assume, and I, that's sort of the, the, the best statistical evidence that we ever have in, our, in the research that Mark Gabor and I have done. If there are very, very few copies, then it wasn't a success. And uh, if there are a lot of copies that have survived in families and were donated more recently to collecting institutions, I think the chances are that it was more successful. So this one didn't go anywhere. There are only about four or five in the whole wide world, and if you know of any, let us know. <laughs> now, not every imagining of how Lincoln wrote the proclamation, remember, this is Lincoln writing the proclamation, not every one was favorable. But this one was never seen until after the Civil War. This is the work of a, an often misadvertised Confederate artist and part-time dentist. He got you in two ways. <laughs> um, uh, named Adelbert Volk, German-born, Unlike most German immigrants of the day, pro-slavery, pro-Confederacy, didn't really gather the uh, inspiration of the 
1848 revolutions and bring them here. He settled in Baltimore, became a creature of that pro-slavery city. And this is his print, writing, President Lincoln writing the Emancipation Proclamation. His foot is on a Bible. He's dipping his pen into an inkwell <coughs> offered by Satan himself. John Brown is a hero uh, as a saint in the background. The, the curtains are not tie, uh, not American flag curtains. In fact, they have a vulture as a tie back, and vultures are flying in the distance. There's so many great attack things here. There's a liquor decanter in the background because who could have written this unless they were bombed? Is, is what we're is what we're told. My favorite, and I must say, it's one that escaped. Um, the, the Nairobi trio was Mark Gabor and I call ourselves, you're all too young to know what that is, a television thing from the 50s and 60s. But anyway, um, we always thought that was a baboon up there. You see the thing up at the top? But what it is, it's a, a, a classical sculpture covered by the Scottish cap that Lincoln allegedly wore as he snuck through Baltimore. So among all the other charges, he's a drunk, he's, he's a, um, a, a religious, he's a, an ally of Satan's, is the additional charge that he's a coward. Volk is one of the greatest artists of the Civil War, hands down. But we should never overestimate his impact on the culture of the war, because all of his pieces were published subterraneanly in an occupied and heavily censored city. And I don't think that anybody except a circle of friends saw these works until after the war when Confederate war etchings by V. Blada, an anagram of his name, which he used even when it was safe to publish them, came out. Here's an 1861 photograph of Lincoln um, that he inscribed to an old family friend. But more to the point, it became the model for the only other 1863 work I know of by Edward Dalton Marchant. I used to th think it was Marchant until I met a descendant. That's always the best way to find out how to pronounce names of the period. Marchant had three months to work in the White House. In February, March, and April of 1863, even got his son, Captain Henry Marchant, a pass from the Union Army to consult with him. I don't think Captain Marchant was an artist, and he later was killed in action, so it was a nice I always think of this as a nice father and son project, but maybe a less successful artistic venture. Lincoln doesn't look characteristic in that formal white tie and high collar, and the portraiture is not great. The symbolism a little obvious as the shackles on a Statue of Liberty uh, burst apart as he uses a feathered quill, that was a mistake, to sign the Emancipation Proclamation. He painted it, and Lincoln sat for it. It was the first emancipation painting he participated in because they told him it would be displayed in Independence Hall. Lincoln had raised the American flag at Independence Hall on his way to Washington, and he said, I'd rather be assassinated on this spot than to surrender it. That building meant a great deal to him. He had seen it several times in his lifetime, and I'm sure that a little ego was at play here. I'm going to spend my time posing because that's where this is going. Of course, it never went there. Went to the Union, the new Union League Club instead, but by 1864, it had inspired a very fine engraving. Again, not until the presidential campaign, when Lincoln, the emancipator, at least uh, could be used to reinforce the enthusiasm of, of his voting base. It was a popular print. There are plenty around. And another measure of why prints are popular, or how you can tell prints are popular, is that they, in the days of lax copyright for these things, they often spawned adaptations, fakes, and copies, and here's my favorite one of those. A very flat-looking lithograph by a guy named Hogg. Uh, but uh, you can see that it's hardly as attractive as that one, but... And the Statue of Liberty has mercifully vanished, I suppose. Um, Marchant always said he had a lot of trouble getting Lincoln right, and he probably, the results probably show it. But in... Important to keep in mind that in most of the 1864 pictures that are created for the campaign, emancipation is not even mentioned. Um, Lincoln and his running mate are heralded for the uh, as uh, capable of ushering in an era of plenty and renewed commerce and patriotism. 
but there are references. And most of them come in caricature. Um, here is the um, a rather interesting uh, print with a white working man understanding that he has opportunity under Lincoln um, and a mixed race school group coming out of a school symbolizing educational opportunities under the Republicans while George B. McClellan is posed shaking hands with Jefferson Davis and the return of the slave auction. Again, a robust anti-Lincoln visual literature. And I said that prints, by and large, were commercial ventures and not political. This one is an exception because it was uh, manufactured at the, under the supervision of the New York World, a, an, a racist democratic newspaper of the day, and uh, creators of a campaign diversion in 1864, a book called Miscegenation, which they published, in fact, their editors wrote, which very straightforwardly suggested that a mixed race society was the only answer to America's intractable racial problems. Now, they should have left it at that because a lot of people took it seriously. But this, they also came up with cartoons that um, made Lincoln a target for daring to bow to a mixed race couple in the street. And uh, a picture that included such horrific uh, scenes, supposedly, as black and white people dining together or, heaven forbid, a white servant driving a black person through the streets. These are meant to be horrific reminders of what the world would be like under Abraham Lincoln, as was this, a picture that made him, knowing his fondness for Shakespeare, identified him as a fellow, um, treading the boards for equality, or a tyrant who promised, through his tyranny, to usher in um, an era of uh, integration, which was a radical concept. Um, Here's an interesting adaptation, and I show it because it's always important to know what the South is doing. And of course, they're doing very little. And the reason they're doing very little is because they just don't have the paper, they don't have the ink, and they don't have the artists. Able-bodied men are conscripted you know, from 16 to 60. They're going into the Army and Navy, and they're not staying behind, keeping morale high with patriotic pictures. Um, the only artists really who stay in uh, service to their craft in the Confederacy during the war are people engaged in government printing, stamps, and currency. So here's a, something you can adapt if a copy of uh, Punch gets through the blockade, uh, you can convert it into a, or copy it, for a picture for the Southern Illustrated News, which is sporadically published into around 1864 but notice there's that favorite device. Here is Lincoln wearing a sort of an uncharacteristic plantation hat, which artists usually give to Jefferson Davis to remind people about his uh, plantation origins. But here he's got that scotch cap again. So there's always the reminder. There's always that prevailing image of cowardice. Here's um, the most vicious assault on emancipation from the Southern Illustrated News. Again, smaller readership than anything in the North. It's, um, Abraham Lincoln, after issuing the proclamation, reveals himself not as influenced by Satan, but as Satan. He's simply removing his mask and revealing himself. And there's a wonderful little subtext here, um, and that is the unfinished Washington Monument on the right, which has it's a gallows prepared for Abraham Lincoln, but the gallows is made out of log rails of the type that he um, chopped and uh, split as a young man in Illinois. Back to Courier and Ives, this is a more direct uh, reference to um, the difference between the Republican and Democratic platforms. McClellan daring to offer an olive, olive branch to Jefferson Davis and subjugating um, a, an African-American soldier. By that time, there have been discussions that African-American soldiers, even those who surrender, are being captured, returned to slavery, or murdered. Lincoln is furious about it. And here is a warning to voters that it could happen more widely if McClellan is the president. While Lincoln subdues Jefferson Davis, 
um, with the aid of a black soldier. And just to keep in mind, these are not completely enlightened prints. The black soldier speaks in, quote, Negro dialect. So, you know, the progressivism of the image makers and the Republican mainstream only goes so far. Here's another image that's during the campaign made into a piece of calligraphy and another photograph. These are both $5 bills photographs. I love this picture because he's so gigantic. <laughs> and and uh, made into yet another uh, piece of calligraphy. But the man who really is responsible for the image of Lincoln, I suppose, as great emancipator is this fellow. And I think I use this because they're both sitting in the same chair. They're both sitting in <laughs> Alexander Gardner's famous chair in his photography studio. The man at the right is an upstate New York painter named Francis B. Carpenter, who talked his way into the White House in February 1864, a year and a month after emancipation, by saying he wanted to do a painting, not of the writing of the proclamation, not of the signing of the proclamation, these obvious symbolic moments, but of the moment when Lincoln first assembled his cabinet in July 1862 and read this very sketchy draft. By sketchy, I mean the old definition of sketchy, not the current definition of sketchy. This brief and incomplete draft of the Emancipation Proclamation to his cabinet, at the end of which reading, his cabinet turned on him and said, you can't do that. It's a terrible time to do that. It'll be the last, consider the sh last shriek on the retreat. So you should retreat, wait for battlefield victory. But that's what Carpenter said he wanted to do. And he commissioned photographs of Lincoln for this purpose, and even commissioned a, a photographer to come to the White House and take what is the first photograph ever made inside the White House in 1864 of Lincoln sitting at the head of his cabinet table, which is not only the place where he read the proclamation, but the place where he signed it, and you see it suffers from the inevitable bad light. But it's a remarkable glimpse. You can see some of the wallpaper and the maps that he had around the room. And he did preliminary um, sketches, oil sketches. Carpenter got six months to work in the White House. So he did Salmon Chase, Edmund Stanton. These are really good. And they're all in the Union League Club in downtown Manhattan. Uh, Carpenter didn't save a lot of money, so he used these as his entrance fee. Blair, Secretary of the Navy, Gideon Wells, with his red toupee and his white beard. And one that has not worn very well, and that's Lincoln. It's a little bit um, filmy, but that's the Lincoln. And then he posed uh, at, at a table looking like the cabinet table. This is Carpenter posing exactly the way he wanted Seward to pose, and then he painted him that way. Seward was going to be, um, well, let me show you the other sketches first. Here are some sketches that I found in his scrapbook. His, his descendants still own all of his scraps uh, in upstate New York. They carry it around in the trunk of their car to different things. It's just a kill thing. Uh, sketches of the office, Lincoln sitting the way he wanted him to sit. And then this is the, this is the final sketch of his composition. And you can see number one is Lincoln, but number two is Seward. And the moment he shows, and here is an early photograph of what the painting looked like when it first went on display in the East Room and then all across the country. It's gigantic. I don't know if any of you have ever seen it. It's in the Capitol building above the Senate stairway. Uh, he always wanted it to be in the <coughs> rotunda, which is why he painted it the exact size of the great Trumbull paintings in the rotunda but it wasn't purchased until the rotunda was filled. He didn't get there. Anyway, Seward is, Lincoln has put the proclamation down and Seward is objecting to it. So why is Seward the centerpiece? Well, you know, he, uh, Carpenter is um, from Auburn, New York, from the Auburn region, and so is Seward. Seward's the man, you know? Mm -hmm. So here's the painting as it looks today. The proclamation is being set aside. It's remarkable that this became the most famous rendering of emancipation. By the way, the cabinet, he didn't believe in symbolism or allegory, but he did put the liberals on the left and the conservatives on the right, and he did say that that's what he was doing. Um, and immediately it became um, a model for a popular print, and Lincoln signed on as the first subscriber, but he never lived to get it because Carpenter was a reviser, and here is an early 
advertisement for the print and the print itself, published by Alexander Ritchie in New York, and an extraordinary success. And as you look at a big change, he has set it aside in the painting, but he does have it back in his clutches in the original, because if you go back, that's the way it was in the original painting. Carpenter just revised and revised and revised, and really messed up the portraiture to a certain extent. Well, we know this one was popular because it inspired countless variations on the theme of the cabinet together. Um, and here's one where everybody sort of moved around. <laughs> and the table is truncated. Seward is in the back of the table now. Um, here's another one. And this, this, is, this is my favorite. This is done by a guy named Kelly in New York. And not only is, the, is it secondary, but General Grant seems to have shown up. <laughs> now, Kelly puts this out in 1865, just at the time when the Southern marketplace is reopened to New York publishers who have been denied these customers all these years. So he puts out one more version of this. <laughs> this is Jefferson Davis and the Confederate cabinet with Robert E. Lee in place of uh, Ulysses S. Grant. And um, I don't know if, uh, I don't think Abraham Lincoln ever realized that uh, Fred, if uh, Jefferson Davis ever realized that he was holding the Emancipation Proclamation <laughs> in, this, uh, in this print. Carpenter's original um, remained uh, in print for 30 years. I found a New York Times item once about a fire in a warehouse in the 1890s, and the report didn't talk about human casualties, but it said, for all those who have inquired, the great steel plate of the Carpenter print has been saved. So this was a well-known piece of popular art, issued in all sorts of forms, including ones that tried to resuscitate the, the document itself. And others didn't do as well. This is Lincoln signing again with Seward, looking unhappy um, <laughs> at that moment. I mean, there was no emancipation moment. This is David Danger's emancipation moment. Although, here again, in the absence of this, artists did try in some parts of, in some aspects of the genre, in some interpretations, to create this myth that Lincoln had gone out and literally unshackled people. Maybe people always knew it was symbolic, but it's a little embarrassing. This is one that was stolen by Courier and Ives and became more famous as a, as a Courier and Ives creation than as the original creation by Wenderoff and Taylor. And yet another variation on the theme is the midnight hour that I mentioned a slave cabin, one is meant to assume, with soldiers gathered there to read the news that the proclamation has uh, been approved. Of course, it didn't happen at midnight, so I don't know what the tortures are about or why these people have leisure, which, of course, they didn't. But it's, you know, it's a concept. Um, here's one that suggests that the proclamation is coming directly from the hand of God into one of those um, African-American churches. And here is a major breakthrough. It's not a great work of art, but it is, for the first time, a work of emancipation iconography clearly designed for the African-American audience. Frederick Douglass was one of the great advocates of chromolithographs and other kinds of prints for the free black home. He did a whole campaign about uh, the new print of Hiram Revels, who took Jefferson Davis's place in the United States Senate. Uh, his seat, African-American, and he said, heretofore these devices have been denied the colored home, but it's important that we purchase these prints and show our families about our history and our, and our opportunities and, ins and, and inspire them. And here we have an angel of color um, handing Lincoln the scroll. She's just handed Lincoln the scroll and verse on the bottom. For anyone, and you know, on the, you see here we've got African Americans rising from forced labor to the halls of government. That's the, the, the bottom portraiture. But this poem is very direct and very commercial. Freedom, oh freedom, oh sweet welcome. This joyful news was spoken by Lincoln. Not good rhyme, but we'll go on. <laughs> Reverence him though our skins are dark. Reverence him in our churches and parks. 
Let us teach our children to do the same and teach them never to forget his name. He was our Moses to us and our race and our children should never forget his face. That is not a subtle <laughs> message. And if you look, <coughs> there's the poem. But an amazing breakthrough. This is 1867. And I promised I would do one Thomas Nast, um, a, a famous adaptation of a newspaper woodcut which was made into a popular print by King and Beard called Eman Emancipation. Again, contrasting scenes of brutality with the central ideas of family and, and, and opportunity. And then this, po this print almost illustrating Lincoln's op offer of implicit offer of opportunity in education, a recruiting poster, Freedom to the Slave, which has a direct call to enlistment on the reverse. In a way, this, uh, this served to be a, a print about liberty and freedom and uh, emancipation almost as much as the emancipation prints. This is Curtin Allison's um, post-war depiction of the storming of Fort Wagner um, by the 54th Massachusetts. And I always think it should be calculated within this, uh, the iconography of emancipation because it does, although it focuses on a white colonel, it still focuses on African Americans fighting for their own freedom. And that's a rarity in prints of the period. They did one other print showing African Americans, and that was, of course, the horrific Fort Pillow massacre, one of those incidents that Lincoln learned about and deplored. And then we go to 13th Amendment iconography, which I, I'm writing about now. I'll explain later if anybody is interested, but very little, just some news, of, you know, pictorial reporting on the passage of the amendment in the House and a uh, picture of those who participated, including Lincoln, who signed the resolution and was actually condemned by Congress because presidents weren't required to sign amendment resolutions, and he, they thought he was sort of hogging things and had gone signature happy. Not much iconography, again, about the 13th Amendment. This is a 13th Amendment. That's the um, a detail of this 13th Amendment grouping and another 13th Amendment picture. Lincoln himself you know, is not really depicted with people of color. Um, and the one exception and some of it is retrospective, is, um, is his entrance into Richmond in April, April 4th, 1865. Um, it was the only moment when, when he um, understood what he meant to people of color. And um, enough reports were written at the time to convince me that indeed, um, people freed under the terms of the proclamation, because that's the proclamation, under the terms of the proclamation, once Union troops occupied Richmond, these people were free. They did rush to him, and um, one elderly man, according to two sources, knelt to him, and Lincoln said, you must not kneel to me, you must thank only God for your freedom, while white citizens sort of huddled behind their curtains on the second floors, not thinking to greet him. One old, the same old man stood up and then tipped his hat to Lincoln, and Lincoln tipped his hat back. And that was considered a, a scene, of, a disgusting scene to some of the white observers. Thomas Nass did this. It's also in the Union League, but he was not there. And neither was Benjamin Russell, whose print this is, although here we see little tad more visible. Um, he only lived to about 17, but this was how he spent his 12th birthday, April 4th, 1865 walking with his dad into Richmond, um, not as a conqueror, but sort of as a pacifier. And there were exaggerations of that scene too, like Lincoln arriving in Richmond. It's really, it's called Lincoln arriving in City Point. He never liberated any people or met any people of color. And then of course, after the war, we have Lincoln emerging as the martyr to freedom. Here's a woman who, I'm gonna try to rush through a little because I've talked so much already, but. Here's a woman who is also responsible for promulgating the Lincoln image, a 16-year-old sculptress named Vinnie Reen, who spent some time with Lincoln making that sculpture that you see in this George Caleb Bingham painting. And Mary Lincoln did not like the idea of a pretty 16-year-old girl 
hanging around with her husband. And she was particularly mortified when she sat in the galleries of the Senate while they debated giving her a very lucrative commission to make it into a statue. And Mary Lincoln complained to one correspondent that this audacious woman had secured the commission by leaning over the galleries of the Senate and showing her busts to the public. <laughs> nice play on sculpture. This is what she came up with. Abraham Lincoln as an emancipator, clutching the proclamation. It still lives in the rotunda of the Capitol. This is obviously flopped, for which, or the other one is flopped. Who knows? Well, that one's not because of the writing, but it may be anyway. This is the way it looks now. That actually looks right. Lincoln holding the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, at one point, it was so controversial, people didn't like, just didn't like the work, that they tried to move it, and the workers broke off the scroll. And they were so upset with what they had done, with their sacrilege, that they just retreated. And, um, and they never moved it again. It's been there through presidential funerals. Uh, Leonard Wells Volk's uh, interpretation, he did the famous life mask of Lincoln, but here he is now as an emancipator in an expanded portrait and in the main statue he did in Springfield. And then we've got this whole other genre of the kneeling slave <coughs> after a, um, you know, the inspiration of Courier and Ives and, and tradition. The kneeling slave is part of abolitionist iconography. And here is Randolph Rogers' version, Lincoln and the Emancipated Slave. It's a maquette from 1866. This is a, a, a work of an African-American artist, David Bowser, um, an admirer of Lincoln's who lived to be 100, did lots of Lincoln's. And of course, the case of Thomas Ball, the most famous of all the kneeling slave pictures uh, of statues. And this is his model for it. And this, what he ended up producing for Lincoln Park in Washington. Frederick Douglass himself was present at the dedication of this statue and used the opportunity for probably the most famous speech ever made about Abraham Lincoln, saying he was principally the white man's president, not the black man's president. It was an extraordinary address, which I recommend to you. Ulysses S. Grant unveiled it without a sound, without a word. Mm -hmm. And this is the way it looked. It was, it was paid for entirely by people of color in small contributions. And you know, politically correct, it may be, but in its day was a sort of a shrine, inspiring postcards and other, um, other pieces. Here's a fascinating piece I saw in Cleveland, um, done in 1894 by a relief sculpture by a veteran named Levi Schofield. Not a kneeling slave in the tradition of the kneeling slave, but a kneeling slave receiving not a blessing, uh, not a patronizing hand, but a weapon from Abraham Lincoln to fight for his own freedom. Something of a breakthrough again, but think of the year, 1894. And a little Aikens to remind people of the multi-generational impact of of emancipation. Lincoln persists in emancipation iconography or patriotic iconography through World War I. This is a welcome home of an African-American veteran uh, and a testament to the fact that Lincoln's picture decorated many homes of African-Americans into the 20th century. We have so many testimonials about that. And kneeling slave evocations continue. Thomas Hart Benton's uh, Lincoln for uh, historical black college, Lincoln University. For some reason, the, the Benton archive will not let me have a color reproduction of this. They are totally bonkers. In case anybody has to deal with them one day, lots of luck. Um, and here, Carpenter's image inspires um, William Johnson, great uh, 20th century artist. Um, who sees the emancipation table as symbolically containing the bodies of slaves who had died uh, over the years, including lynchings. Um, this is William Johnson's version of the signing. Douglas is not just a voice of influence, not just a conscience. He's in the picture. Um, and in this William Johnson scene, there is a trio. This is not Holzer, Borat, and Neely. This is John Brown, Frederick Douglass, and Abraham Lincoln. Extraordinary body of work, all related to emancipation and all by um, William Johnson. Um, around 39, he did a WPA mural focused on the war. 
And in his view of Gettysburg or Lincoln presiding over ghosts, I like to think the latter. And in the sacred ground um, that he sees, there are African-American troops at Gettysburg, even though in reality, the governor of Pennsylvania thought it was not a good idea to have African-American troops in the Battle of Gettysburg, and they did not participate. This, um, I have it as a black and white because there is no color in an image that survives. It's one of them, a mysterious image. It's, it's by Palmer Hayden, African-American artist, and it's sort of a self-portrait. It's called The Janitor Who Paints. Um, he, he, it's somewhat of a caricature in its portraiture, but it's, it's, um, it, it portrays a real artist working as, uh, who works as a janitor to make ends meet, and you see his, his work is guided by the spirit of Lincoln in the home. But the finished canvas, which is far more realistic, um, what happened? Lincoln is eliminated, and it may be a sign of the iconography to come that Lincoln vanishes from the final picture. I don't know if that one is another version in another state or simply the original that was later painted over. We're not sure. Um, equally provocative Horace Pippin work from 1942 called Abraham Lincoln great emancipator. And the irony here is that Lincoln is emancipating a white soldier we're supposed to assume guilty of some act and he's pardoned him. So emancipation applies to more than, than one race. Um, increasingly complicated um, iconography. This is Basquiat. Um, it's called Obnoxious Liberals. Maybe you can explain it to me later. Um, Travis Somerville, Smokey Joe on my mind. Lincoln and caricatures again, 1990. Um, the wonderful Carol Walker and her work in, uh, in silhouettes. This is called Emancipation Approximation. Um, provocative, disturbing, like all of her very frank work. Or this version of Lita and the Swan, the myth um, of rape, and uh, which she has moved into a plantation scene. Cut quickly to uh, the 20s. This is the dedication of the Lincoln Memorial presided over by Warren Harding, Uncle Joe Cannon, who had seen Lincoln from life, the Speaker of the House, and Robert Lincoln, the surviving son of Abraham Lincoln, who did not say anything there. And of course, we know what was dedicated that day. And of course, the Lincoln Memorial um, itself uh, is a reigning image of Lincoln as a statesman and an emancipator. Um, at the opening event, only one African-American speaker was allowed to speak, Robert Russell Moton, who is Booker Washington's successor as head of the Tuskegee Institute, and his speech was censored by President Harding himself. That's a rare honor, I suppose. But Harding did not like the phrase that said, the promise of the emancipation will never be free until we live the, the, the promise that Lincoln um, uh, gave to us. And Harding said, that's not a very good idea to do that. Um, at this ceremony, by the way, um, mounted soldiers herded black spectators to the back of the audience. Um, that was 1920s Washington, D.C. I was just, I'm mortified to say, given a medal in Constitution Hall by the Daughters of the American Revolution. I did not wear the medal today for, I'm not going to wear it, although it comes in a Velcro, Velcro frame, so I can take it out and like, wear it in my militaristic moments. But Constitution Hall is the place, some of you may know, where Marian Anderson was forbidden to sing in 1936 because she was, Afro, she was African American. Instead, she showed everybody up by singing magnificently in front of the Lincoln Memorial to hundreds of thousands of onlookers and made the first great use of the Lincoln Memorial as a backdrop, as it were, for freedom. The Lincoln Memorial return has become the predominant Lincoln image of a statesman, not only because of, um, of Dr. King. Um, one of the best things the Lincoln Bicentennial Commission, the predecessor of the foundation, ever did was pay for the I Have a Dream tablet on the floor to be re-incised. It's so worn away from people standing on it to have their picture taken that you couldn't even read it anymore. So it's a nice little side accomplishment. But it, 
the image returned in a vengeance in, in um, 2008 and 9 as a symbolic um, cheerleader um, <laughs> for the election of Barack Obama. Uh, <laughs> as if the cartoonist, um, <laughs> he's been like this since election day, as if the cartoonist had, um, had decided that this was the culmination of the unfinished work. That's another, another debate. But there he is giving a thumbs up, a fist bump. <laughs> There's Obama climbing up a ladder to do a, a proper greeting or a silent Godspeed on Inauguration Day. Or my favorite, joining the camera generation to take a, a cell phone picture of President Obama uh, on the night before the inauguration when he does his Lincoln Memorial event. And here he is showing the civil rights veterans the picture that I started this uh, slideshow with. That's what we used to call them. He's got a painting of Lincoln in the office, and here he is showing that Emancipation Proclamation that um, he's, so, he's so understandably proud of. Again, back to the Lincoln Memorial. This is the best-selling New Yorker in the history of the magazine, and it's the famous O from, the, from uh, uh, Illuminated for Obama, and the Lincoln Memorial as the silent witness on the eve of Inauguration Day. And it calls to mind to me a great work by Langston Hughes, who, when he saw the Lincoln Memorial for the first time, wrote, let's go see old Abe sitting in the marble and the moonlight, sitting lonely in the marble and the moonlight, quiet for 10,000 centuries, old Abe, quiet for a million, million years, quiet and yet a voice forever against the timeless walls of time, old Abe. So in a sense, this marble, generic, old Abe, once inaccessible, to people of color and belongs to everyone, and not just the printmakers and sculptors, but to people who still come up there with their phones and take pictures of their kids and grandkids and parents and brothers and sisters in front of the statue. Um, the generic Lincoln, whose status as a liberator has otherwise all but evaporated from heroic art, um, is now routinely used and abused on this monumental stage by just about any cause or crank, because without this emancipation specificity once attached to his image, pro and con, all of us sort of lay claim to this kind of oversimplified uh, generic protector image that remains for better um, or for worse. So here it is in its most recent use. Um, on the anniversary, no less, of the March on Washington. Um, this is Glenn Beck standing near where Dr. King stood for his own march on Washington. So is the, is the Lincoln image worth guarding? I invite you all to be a judge. Thank you.